Welcome to the Seattle Investors Club podcast with Julie Clark and Joe Bauer, where we share the nuts and bolts of real estate investing from our 20 plus years in the industry. Sit back, relax, listen, and immediately take action. Are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate podcast. My name is Joe Bauer and I'm here with my co-host, Julie Clark. Julie, how are you doing today? I am doing good, Joe. Doing good. Today was the very first morning, I'll say, out here in the Seattle area that I went outside because my garage is full of a car with a flat tire and a bunch of my kids' crap. My windshield was frozen this morning for the very first time. So winter is upon us over here in the Pacific Northwest. Nice. Yeah. Where are you at? You know, I am over here in North Haven, Connecticut, and it's about 60, 62 degrees. Ooh, that's nice. Actually, it is, it is beautiful and sunny here today, but I think we've, we've started to hit our cold streak here. So what's in New Haven, Connecticut? New Haven, is that where you're at? New Haven. Uh, North Haven, Connecticut, which oh, is North just Haven. around the corner from New Haven, which I recently learned is known for their pizza. So I'm going to go and sample that later this evening. Nice. Um, but it's pretty much on the way to New York City, and we have a good friend that owns a CrossFit gym here in North Haven, so we're stopping in and pretty much staying in the CrossFit gym parking lot for the next few days. Wow. Yeah. Live in large. Yeah. Live in large. So as you guys all know, I think by now, Joe is on a year-long road trip to hit uh, all the national parks with his girlfriend, Emily, in their badass van. Um, and if you haven't checked it out yet, check out the fantastic life on all your social media accounts there and you will have some serious envy, <laughs> right? If you like parking lots right now, if you like parking lots. So Joe does a lot of traveling. Um, I am stuck here in the Seattle area, but our guest today, Ryan Gibson does a lot of traveling as well. Ooh, good one. There's my transition. <laughs> In, for many reasons, for more than one reason, our friend Ryan travels back and forth, not only back and forth from West Coast to East Coast, but even across the Atlantic. So, Ryan, what's up? That's my transition. How you doing? I love it. I love it. Thanks, thanks Julie. That was a great transition. And, uh, <laughs> Joe, that sounds like a lot of fun. Really interesting. Yeah, it's I, been, it's been an adventure. <laughs> well, I get to, to join you guys from West Palm Beach, Florida. Oh, oh! Yeah, where it is 90 degrees. What and, are you doing uh, in West Palm? Well, just down here for a work trip. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So we'll get I to used travel. to actually, I actually used to um, oversee from an ownership perspective, a big apartment building, a couple of them in West Palm. So I used to fly to West Palm on a regular basis um, back for my multifamily days there. So, oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice area down here. And I heard there's a very presidential person living here too. Yes. Yeah. Let <laughs> me know if you run into him. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So you're down yeah. there. So let me, we want to introduce you, you know, for those of you who don't know Ryan Gibson, um, Ryan is with Spartan Investors. Is it Spartan Investors or Spartan Investor Group? Hey, uh, Investment Spartan, Inve- Group. Spartan Investment Group. Yep. Spartan Investment Group. Um, and he is in charge of investor relations and capital raising projects as their chief investment officer um, and a local Seattle guy um, that we have on That's the right. podcast with us today. And if yeah, you guys. I, uh, right here in the Green Lake area, not too far from you. Awesome sauce, yes. We just talked about having lunch at Bongo's. If you guys haven't checked out our friend Matt's restaurant called Bongo's, get over there if you love Caribbean food. But. That is for another time. Um, Spartan <laughs> Investment Group is a real estate investment company that specializes in finding self-storage deals and residential redevelopment investments. Um, these guys are really kicking butt in their specialty and their niche. Um, super smart. Um, and I encourage you guys all to check out their website and check out the projects that they've got going. And we're going to talk more and dive deep into what Spartan Investment Group is all about today because you guys are going to love to hear about something other than fix and flips and other types of asset classes that you might be able to get 
um, involved in to, um, you know, pursue that financial freedom. So let's do it. Joe. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, no, no, go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead, Joe. Sorry. I didn't mean to. <laughs> it's all, it's all good, man. So the first question is always something that gets us to know you a little bit deeper. And we love to, we would love to know what your background is, where you grew up, how you got to where you are today. Um, so lay it on us. Yeah, sure. So grew up in Michigan in the, De- in the Detroit area and uh, fell in love with flying uh, airplanes uh, when I was about 16 or uh, 16 years old. Learned how to fly and got a commercial airline job when I was about 21. And that took me down to Washington, D.C. to fly out of our nation's capital, where I eventually um, re- uh, ran pilot housing. Um, Kind of on the side is my first real estate side hustle where I organized living arrangements for pilots who live in different parts of the country and need housing temporarily a few times a month. Is there a name for that? Like crash pads? Crash crash pads. Yeah, cool. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So I had one in Philly, had one in DC. Um, It was fun. It was uh, a lot of of transactions and a lot of uh, work, but um, you know, great bunch of guys that were in the pad and, you know, obviously pilots are super professional and easy to deal with. So, um, so yeah, we did that for a while and, uh, I really wanted to get into owning my, you know, owning our first home. So our, my wife and I kind of saved every single dollar we had and watched the 2000, two, uh, 2007, 2008, uh, market kind of come apart right. We were in the middle of our savings plan. Um, and, uh, not that we're geniuses or anything, but kind of waited for it to bottom out and then bought a bought our first house in a neighborhood that was uh, changing very rapidly close to Mass transit and right down in, in downtown Washington and ended up doing a complete rehab on the project and um, flying was kind of slow at the time I was home a lot so I got to kind of watch the contractors go through and get an eye for that and one day this military uh, army guy bald-headed guy was walking down the street with his wife and um, and uh, I really wanted this changing neighborhood to be uh, populated with people that, you know, were excited about the neighborhood and moving in. So I stuck my head outside and um, that gentleman bought the house two doors down from me. And uh, he looked inside my house and saw what we did with the renovation. And he said, I want to do the same thing with this house. So he bought that house and blew the top off and uh, went up a level and did a big rehab. And we became really good friends. And uh, Um, eventually business partners. And that's now Scott, um, who's our CEO at Spartan. Super awesome. Neighbors. Neighbors Neighbors to partners. Neighbors to partners. Yep. He was always walking over to my house uh, at random times and banging on my door, coming inside and coming up with these crazy ideas like buying salt from Egypt and importing it and selling it and things like that. And <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Of, you know what? That sounds to me like the, like a new reality show right. <laughs> topic, right? Neighbors to partners. Like that's hilarious. Yeah. That oh, it, it, it totally could have been a reality TV show. Well, and it gets even better. There was actually a house that, you know, these are all row houses in DC. So he was a row house, uh, one door over. And there was the, the house in between us actually was completely abandoned and run down. And I don't think they had running water in there for 20 plus years. So we were like, man, this is the last, one of the last houses on the block. We should figure out how to buy this thing and put, you know, fix it and, and uh, sell it to somebody that would be to have, you know, get another cool neighbor in here. Um, And uh, so we learned how to track down owners, um, look up tax records, look through recorder deeds, um, you know, find, the mysterious owner of this property in our nation's capital, which is a very, very good neighborhood. Um, you know, why somebody hadn't found that, that owner was beyond us. And, um, we figured out it was a guy who died It went to his daughter. She died, went to his son. He died, no will, no probate, nothing with some ownership to a, a niece that lived out of town, you know, tip your typical, uh, you know, wholesale deal or find, you know, finding that off market deal that you really love. And we went through the gamut. We had to hire an attorney turned out when the guy was living, he hadn't paid his property taxes and he had moved out of, and it was an L and so an LLC had bought the tax lien back in the nineties. And that LLC 
then dissolved and the guy paid his taxes, but it was never recorded right. And a huge title mess that we were able to clean up through hiring an attorney and kind of putting some money on the line. And then we pooled our resources together. Um, we bought the house for about a hundred thousand bucks, put about 160 into it, sold it for five fifty six months after we started construction. Nice. We thought, you know what's wow. What's interesting to me about what you're saying is that, you know, I find it, it you guys sort of fell into this, right? I mean, yep. you had done your crash pad stuff, but here you got a neighbor and there's a house in between you that, I mean, it's sure it's a great, it's almost like a, a like, almost like a, like I said, a reality TV show. You guys <laughs> fall into this. It has every problem imaginable, title issues, can't find anybody, everything like on the very first thing. And you guys work so hard to get all the information, get it all figured out. You're not even really a real estate investor at this point. You're just two neighbors who are like, let's take advantage of this dumpy house in between us here, right? And you yep. went from, you, 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 what I find interesting about it is that you're focused just on that one thing this one project and you had a massive success. And what's interesting about investors, I feel like as they, all these investors that are out there today, you know, that want to get in the game is that most of them don't want to do that much work, you know, that you guys did on that very first project. I feel like people want it to be easier than that. And that it's so awesome that your very first attempt where you didn't even, you know, is that you guys had to work that hard to get your deal. Maybe that kicked you off with a different mentality than a lot of investors these days come into this. They sign up for a course and they think they're going to get deals. Yeah. And I, you know, looking back on it, that was a very, very hard deal to uncover, you know, with, with title work and, and things like that. It wasn't, you know, the seller was, you know, willing and we, you know, took some risks on, you know, what to offer her and, you know, things like that, but it, you know, it all worked out really well. And I will say for any investors out there that do not want to do all this work, but want to enjoy investing, we offer that opportunity now to everybody. There you go. So <laughs> as a, as a, uh, you know, as a syndication company, you know, I mean, I do think that the market, you know, to your point, Julie, is like the market's getting harder and harder to find better and better deals. And, like you said, there are weekend crash courses all over the place with hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people going and taking these courses. And then they're going out and they're realizing that the market is a red ocean market saturated with people that want to do the same thing they're doing. And it's very difficult to get that, that return. Some people are successful, but like you said, it takes a lot of work. And so, you know, I think that is why it's so important that at Spartan, we built a team of people that have focuses in those areas and expertise in those areas so that we can provide those opportunities to investors because it is hard to find a right, you know, a property that's priced right in this market, especially since we have rising interest rates. You know, we have um, bidding wars and properties. Uh, we have, um, you know, but we also have a changing economy when interest rates, when interest rates rise, that's when the econ, you know, the barometer of the economy starts to change. So we have a we have an economy that's definitely going to be different, you know, six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. So you've got to really make sure that in this super competitive top of the market environment that we're you know that we're considering what it's going to look like, you know, in in a short period of time because it will be different. Right. You know what I also think is that. Um, I think that people who are getting started and, and want to be in real estate investing, you, you know, they might, um, they might find joy in being hands-on or doing whatever part of the process that they love, right? And so everybody needs to do what they enjoy doing because there's a lot of work in real estate investing, a lot of time that's involved. So if you enjoy doing something, do it. But what you'll soon learn is that you know, in order to, to make that bigger money, you got to get past things like just flipping houses because really that is, is ordinary income and it becomes a day job and sure you can still, you know, scale that and hire people to do that work, but you still have a tax problem associated with that. As soon as you get successful, you'll realize that you need other types of investments to offset 
your ordinary income, which is what flipping is, right? And so That's right. rather than if you enjoy flipping, continue to flip, right? I enjoy, I love brokerage. It sounds crazy to some people, but I just enjoy the people part of it. I, I enjoy the analysis of stuff. I love the research and I love the people part of it. I am not going to fly around the country and look for new investments as I was talking to Ryan about because I'm at a stage in my life where I want to enjoy my kids. I want to, you know, do what I love and the rest of my time I want to spend with my kids. And I love what I love, but yet I know I can make a lot of money doing that, but it's taxed at ordinary income rates. So I have to be an investor um, in other asset classes that have better tax advantages for me. And I know, Ryan, at the end here, we'll cover it. You guys have a webinar coming up just on that topic, right? That we can we'll yeah, give November, a out. Yeah, November 15th. And that's actually a great segue into what we're doing today. Because, you know, we flipped houses and we built, you know, properties to sell and things like that. And, um, you know, there well, are some tax let me strategies. Ask you something before we go down that, because I am going to ask you that. But sure. before, I want to back up for a second and say, so how long has Spartan Investment Group been in existence? Is that you and your partner that were neighbors? Is that the start of Spartan Investment Group? And then how did you guys pick that name? <laughs> so it, start, yeah, it started in late 2013, early 2014. Um, that's when it started on that first property. And um, we've been going ever since. Now there's five full-time people. And the name comes from the original three partners in Spartan, uh, me, Scott, and Brian. Brian is a, um, now a passive investor with us. He doesn't, uh, he's, he's not actively participating um, in Spartan. Brian was a really good friend of Scott's from college, and they both went to Michigan State, which is Michigan State Spartans. So, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, you're, you're kind of, there was some, uh, definitely a long time since Scott had graduated from college, but you get out of college and, well, what do you want to do? Oh, let's, oh, Spartan's kind of a cool name. And, you know, you get the helmet and the, and the spear and all that. And you, and you say, oh, Spartan Investment Group. That's what I'll make my LLC name. And then, you know, it's like, well, we should probably change this because it's, you know, it's this and it's that. And then we're like, ah, eh, we'll get to it later. And then, well, we might want to change the logo. We change the logo. And then we're like, oh, I kind of like the logo. And then, then we're like, hey, we should, we should definitely do a rebrand. And then, five years goes by or four years goes by and it's like everybody kind of knows us as Spartan. Right. And you know, we kind of get that name and it just like, okay, well I guess we'll just, just stick with it. Yeah. Um, I think everybody does know you guys by that name. No, I think you're stuck with it. It's not yeah. a bad name. I was just asking how you guys came up with it. Right. Yeah. So college, yeah, uh, yeah college. And, and we're all from Michigan originally and you know, Michigan state Spartans are kind of a, Thing and Scott and Brian went to Michigan State. I'm actually a Michigan Wolverines fan more than I am a state fan, but I guess I am a. That's kind of the big rivalry. It's kind of like Washington State and UW. So you know what? Anyway. I forgot to mention this to you yeah. earlier, but I lived right. I went to WSU, Washington State University. Go Cougs! For those of you listening, um, yep. <laughs> but right after college, I moved to Ann Arbor for two years, and I lived in Ann Arbor. Oh, cool! Um, yeah, because so you my. Get it. Yeah, my, my boyfriend, my college boyfriend went to graduate school at um, University of Michigan and um, his, um, his dad and stepmom were big up in the university. In fact, um, oh, his cool. stepmom was like vice president. So we lived the life in the president's box, um, had it, had the good life there, no doubt. But I need to go back to the Pacific Northwest. I'll tell you, it's different. It's different in Michigan than it is out here in Seattle, which no, no mountains, no skiing that I'm aware of. I don't know. Couldn't, it was, yeah. uh, I, I think I, I needed to get back to the Pacific Northwest, but there's our little connection there. So moving oh, on. Awesome. So you guys got started um, and you started with that first project. And then what types of investments did you guys start focusing on or as you've been moving forward the last several years? Yeah. So we did, uh, we were just finding one property after another. I mean, we would find these properties that, you know, as you know, typical fix and flip, you know, they look for 70%, you know, ARV all in, or they, you know, sometimes even 80% or sometimes people even do 85%. Um, we early on just decided that we weren't going to do anything that wasn't 50% all in, including, um, real estate fees and taxes and things like that. We were only going to go after the juice 
TS Media's least risky deals guaranteed to make money that we could find. So we didn't focus on volume, we just focused on quality and we focused on really knowing how to find a great project and a great deal. And the reason, part of the reason about that was is just me and Scott are just really conservative and just super risk adverse. Um, and, it, and also we both had full-time jobs. So it wasn't, we weren't really desperate to get a deal and desperate to sort of find the next project to keep the engine turning, so to speak. Yeah. We just, just wanted to get some really big wins under our belt and, and make, and then give that enough buffer to make mistakes. So a great example is we built a project in DC and you know, it was 50% all in um, and we made a crap load of mistakes, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, and we learned a lot what kind and it of, wasn't that what kind we, of project was it? It was a condo conversion. So it was a, um, you know, a transformation of a single family home on a, about a 2000 square foot lot into a, to a big 50 foot building. Um, and just about everything that could go wrong went wrong, but we still made a, you know, a sizable amount of money and the, uh, you know, the mistakes that we made allowed us to grow as developers and kind of cut our teeth on that project and learn about all the things that you need to do to do a big project. And we cut, we started to realize that you can really, when you do a bigger project, sometimes you can reduce a lot of your risk just by through AIA, AIA contracts, you know, uh, performance bonds, you know, stronger agreements that, you know, higher level contractors are willing to sign and agree to, you know, much bigger budgets to work with to make sure you've got the right team in place. And then a lot of times you can get non-recourse financing versus, you know, having recourse financing where you're personally guaranteeing a loan and essentially putting up your personal financial situation up against the project where, you know, with commercial, a lot of times they're basing the loan on the project right? and the deal itself and not you. So it's, uh, you know, kind of learned a lot uh, on that deal. Um, you know, just the property caught on fire, the property um, needed uh, a complete redo of plans um, during this the process. Was, this wasn't the first one that was in between you, you and Scott. It wasn't that. No, it, that one was easy. That was just a complete remodel of a home. I mean, we basically just tore the home down to the studs and it was a simple, you know, si single family home. Um, you know, everything went out, everything went in and there was no, we really liked those projects too. Cause we, we didn't like, I know, I know Julie, you're like the king of prehab. We, uh, we went all the way. We just, we, we, you know, we, we kind of felt like, well, if everything comes out, there's going to be no surprises because everything's coming out. You know, we would go to all the way down to the studs so there wouldn't be like a surprise $5,000. That's your, your that's your risk aversion personality. Exactly. There. Yeah. Yep. I actually kind of like, I love your prehab stories. Um, and I was always, I'm always trying to advocate to Scott. I'm like, oh man, well, let's hear what Julie did. She like bought this condo and like, you know, did a little bit of this, a little bit of that, put it back on the market. Boom. You know? I'm like, we should do that. And he, <laughs> I'm probably the more riskier of the two of us. But uh, well, I actually, um, so now that you mention that, it is November 8th of 2018. Just a shout out to everybody. Just a quick thing on that topic is that I think buyers, at least over here in the Seattle market right now, are afraid to buy fully blinged out flips. And you might think about really? that if you're in other markets investing. Why is that? Because buyer sentiment. It doesn't matter what reality is, right? It matters what the buyer's perception and beliefs are. And right now the buyers think the market's going down because it's all over the news. The market has adjusted down, but we're not in a, you know, free fall downfall. It feels like that at this very moment in November because it's winter and because we just had this adjustment and it's all over the news and all that other stuff. But we're going to end up with probably a softer landing come spring, but that may not change the mentality of buyers, right? Who are afraid right now, in my Julie Clark opinion, as a broker out in the field every day, that they are afraid prices are going down. So maybe they don't want to purchase a fully blinged out, no equity left, no upside left property. When they, it's like, you know, buying a brand new car the moment you drive it off the lot. 
it goes down in value. Or right now, they think values are going down. So they're buying something that has no upside because everything's done. So what I'm telling my flip clients, and maybe this applies across the board on other things, not self-storage, but, um, you know, to be maybe consider, uh, you can't get away with a, a, my favorite prehab model, which is the game of see how little you can do and put it back on and it'll still get bid up. That's over. But now there's a hybrid version, right? There's a middle ground that maybe can be tested. So I would not want to do a full flip these days because I think the buyers are scared. I'd rather leave the basement rec room. I'd just paint the walls with panels and, you know, throw some carpet and just make sure the bathroom works and is clean rather than leave them some upside because they think, well, if I, if I just improve that downstairs area or I remodel downstairs, then I can get my money back if values continue to go down. But if they buy something 100% completely done right now, November, 2018, um, they're afraid they're just going to lose money. Make sense? You know, it's all buyer sentiment, you know? I agree. And that's my little pitch on that. But Hey guys, Joe here. I just want to take this super quick break from the action to let you know something that we have really cool to offer you guys. As you know, marketing is a lifeblood of our real estate business. And Julie and I spend a ton of money sending out postcards and letters to people all around the Seattle area. We've partnered up with yellowletters.com to get you guys 10% off all of your marketing needs at Yellow Letters. All you have to do is go to yellowletters.com and when you check out, use the code Seattle Investors Club and you'll get 10% off any of your marketing needs at yellowletters.com. You can send you postcards, letters, whatever it may be that yellowletters.com has so that you can keep your marketing engine running for a little less money. So go to yellowletters.com, use the code Seattle Investors Club with no spaces and get your marketing going today. All right, let's get back to the action. Like I said, you guys are still focused. Are you doing more condo conversions or uh, I know you guys are doing we, some of those in self-storage and now some land entitlement and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so we've, we've pretty much done, you know, a lot of that, um, you know, <laughs> Now, now we're kind of, you know, the, the 50% ARV was great and, and it made good, good return, but now we're kind of focused on, you know, a little bit more ROT or return on time. And it's not that, you know, and it's a return on time for everybody, right? I mean, it's all of our investors and all of us. So we actually are looking at, you know, the self storage asset class as a, uh, as an asset class that requires, it has the least amount of variability below the line, meaning that when you buy a hundred unit apartment or even a four unit apartment, you've got four water heaters, four countertops, four cabinets, four sets of appliances. You got, you got floors, you got tenants, you've got toilets, termites, running water, electricity, everything that could go wrong that will, and eventually does. And then you have that expense. So you, and you, and you run the numbers and you make your CapEx budget and you do all that stuff. And then things inve- inevitably go wrong. And if you don't think they're going to go wrong, you're wrong. They will eventually. So what we like about storage is the variability below the line. And trust me, things go wrong with storage, but, but there's a lot less variability below the line. And what I like about that is we just bought a facility in Colorado and there's no running water to the site. There's no toilets, no countertops, no cabinets, no water heaters, nothing. All it is is storage buildings with roll up doors and a place to put their belongings. So and, the risk though with storage is vacancy then, right? Correct. And we've been operating um, at about 97% occupancy since we started. So in, in vacancy is, is definitely a risk that is true among any asset class. Our average stay at this facility is 4.5 years. So our customers do not leave. Our longest customer has been there since 1989. So, so it that, is a. Does that mean that when you're doing your feasibility in the beginning, right? Is yep. that I mean that is a, a huge, huge important part of 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 that process with the self storage, right? Because you have less you have less variables below the line, like you say, that are a pain in the ass, right? But yep. you have also less 
is it, it maybe I'm wrong. This is a discussion. Um, are there less variables then um, to recover if you have a vacancy problem? I mean, I know you guys are smart as heck and you added in your propane thing, but I guess people only, oh, that's the RV park though, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so here's, so here's, yeah. So, so I, there was a, there was a gentleman speaking on stage at a conference and there was, there was a mobile home park guy who was expertise, self-storage, residential, assisted living, fix and flip, and a hard money lender. And everybody on the stage got to compete a bit against, you know, what's better, what's worse, what do you like, what, you know, and the self-storage guy said, I have the lowest resting heart rate among all the other asset classes, meaning that <laughs> there, there's no, yeah, you'll appreciate that, Joe. Yeah. Um, there's no, you don't get, ex, you don't have to get excited about anything. There's no, um, sup, like real surprises. Now, do we have stories? Absolutely. We I have all kinds of funny stories of people and what we find and, and, and things that happen and, you know, things like that. But it's, you know, there, there's, there's just not a lot of things to do. And I'll give you a great example. One of our facilities is unmanned, meaning we don't even have anybody there. People can go on our website, book their storage unit, sign their agreement, get a code, go to the site, open the gate, go to their locker, put their stuff in, lock it and leave and never talk to anybody. Nice. No, no meetings, no, you know, Oh, tour of the site none of that stuff. So we really like it because it's, it's expandable from a, you know, scale from scaling and, you know, you got to know how to put the systems in place and the bookings. And, you know, I think we have probably about 15 different um, technology uh, things that we use. I, I remember um, you guys had a post asking what technology we use in the business. Um, and I started writing it down and I'm like, Oh my God, there is a lot of different software platforms that we use that all kind of integrate into our facility. But there's just so many things that you can do to automate the facility. And really, you know, for a facility that depending on the size, you know, that justifies having sort of a customer service person there. And that person is really there for customer service and to sell, you know, the, the, the units and to interact with the customers that want that piece but the facility has to be large enough to justify it. So you can't have a, you know, a 20,000 square foot facility necessarily with a, with a, with a manager because you're going to hurt your valuation and it's just not big enough to really warrant having a manager there. So one thing we really like about storage as well is cost segregation. I know that's kind of a fancy term for essentially just appreciating the property. You know, a great example on our webinar are, investors will pay no taxes on their gain through the, through the life of the investment. So, you know, and that's one thing that storage, you know, really does because, you know, a lot of the contents, land improvements and buildings are built and constructed in a way that is more temporary. And they're not, they're not paying taxes because there is a paper loss because of, right. So, so that's the beauty and that can work that way with multifamily as well, right? That's right. And a yeah. lot of other, it, absolutely. This is not just a self-storage thing. Um, a lot of the walls, partition walls and interior, um, just one small example is, um, you know, like an, an interior wall of a building of an apartment building is, is drywalled and permanent or permanent in nature may not be able to be put in short-term life. Well, a metal build, metal storage building with metal partition walls is all short-term life because it's more temporary in nature. Gosh. So it gives, it gives kind of a more it kind of turbocharges the deductions that you can get um, from you, a self. Do you think that self storage uh, class is um, more favorable for that type of cost segregation than apartments? Is that sort of what we're saying potentially? Maybe. I mean, I don't know enough about taxes. I mean, I, I study it as much as I can, but, I don't know enough about it to know, to really state, you know, either way, but I will say that, you know, you can, it seems like with cost segregation, the benefits are if the contents or the land improvements or the building is, if it, if it's temporary in nature, it goes to the, the shorter term life. And if it's more permanent, it goes to the longer term life. So I would just say that an asset class that would provide the most, and you know, every facility is built differently too, right? I mean, if, you can build a self storage facility out of concrete masonry block, like the one we're building here in Washington. Um, 
you know, you can build one like, you know, the one in uh, Colorado where it's stick built. Um, or, you know, you can do a mix of, you know, metal Actually, buildings. that is a super ninja thing you just said. There is probably like a, like a, uh, oh, you just got me excited about that. <laughs> there is probably like some sort of ninja best way. Like if you could choose to build your building with these products, with this thing, backing and reverse engineering that from a cost segregation standpoint of what's most favorable, right? There's almost- That's a- basically, that's basically my entire day. That's pretty much my job as a, you know, at Spartan, you know, in coordination with Scott is I am on the phone all day in meetings all day, deciding what materials to use because there's second and third order effects of everything. I mean, if you decide to use wood, it's not going to last as long as concrete masonry block. If you decide to use metal, you know, it's more susceptible to damage because if somebody bumps your building and it looks, you know, you have to repaint it and it looks worse and then, you know, but it's less expensive, but steel's going up and there's tariffs and what well, you get the cost seg- benefits and, you know, you get building efficiency and you got to do right. fire rated walls. And this is all these decisions that are going on all the time. And that's pretty much what, you know, is at the heart of our development uh, team, right? So yes, absolutely. There is some strategic, you know, Ways Let me ask to, you, we're getting really, we're getting really egghead about this. We're, we're sure. barking out a little bit, which is super cool. Do you think that, you know, because there's this thing called depreciation recapture when you sell, you know, when you sell a property that you have to pay 25% tax on depreciation recapture, right? Sort of yep. like phantom income in a way, right? That's right. Do you think that there's any risk, like that, that, that the length of hold needs to be calculated into the benefits of accelerated depreciation or you could screw absolutely yourself. absolutely exactly. yep absolutely and you know we look at you know we really get to know our investors we actually use an exemption called 506b of the sec regs which allows you to raise money from sophisticated investors that you have a pre-existing relationship with they can be unaccredited or accredited but that we have to have a pre-existing relationship and they have to have a level of sophistication to understand the deal. So with that being said, we have a personal, we use 506B most frequently because we want to have a personal relationship with everybody in the deal and understand their situation, right? So a lot of our investors are in the, the higher tax brackets, right? So handing a, let's say it's an 8% return on 50 grand or you know $4,000 for the year, handing somebody $4,000 in a passive investment that does not qualify for um, for being excluded from earned income added to your earned income. They probably are paying earned income on that four grand. And if they're in the highest tax bracket, even a, a percentage over twenty five percent to a, to as much as thirty seven percent, they're going to pay the highest taxes on those dollars in that year, right? So even if you make over one hundred and fifty thousand, you're paying north of twenty five percent. So if you can take all of the if you can take the paper loss and wipe out the gain in that year, that's better right. to take the gain, to take the advantage then and then pay the recapture 25% in a future date because that is the, you know, the arbitrage between the 25% and the 37% is a good, is good for the investor, especially since you, you know, when you want to save money, you want to save money today so you can invest now and get more gain over time, right? You don't well, want to unless defer. you can exchange, right? If you later Exactly. That's another thing too is, you know, we do we've never executed a 1031 within a within a syndicated deal like a, you know, a deal we buy in, uh, with investors. Um but you know, it's not something that we would be, you know, uh, it's it's definitely something we can do. We can restructure ownership, do a you know, a tenant in common, roll the proceeds from that sale and go buy another deal with that tenant in common. There's no reason why we couldn't do that. And, you know, a lot of invest, you know, it's conversations we have with our investors. We do, we have a monthly email for every project explaining exactly what's going on with the project. We have a quarterly um, distribution if, if the property is cash flowing. And then we also do a quarterly teleconference and we get everybody on the call and we get, you know, we tell everybody what's going on and we get everybody's feedback. Because a lot of people, you know, it's, it's amazing what comes out of those calls. Um, investors sometimes. You, do you guys, do you guys, um, 
do you guys have like a break even, you know, like you know that you have, a, if you run at vacancy at 80%, as far as your leverage goes, you we guys do. are paying, when you, are you leveraging at your purchase or are you using all cash from investors to purchase and you refinance later? How does that work for you guys? So right now we're all cash, all cash from investors you refinance later. So that gives you maximum flexibility. Um, you know, for example, our RV park that we acquired this year, we can go down to 30% occupancy and still pay all the bills. So that's like a really good, we call it a sensitivity analysis. We look at every single project and we say, what's the catastrophic situation and, and when can we, when does it become a problem? I mean, if you can imagine that you're, you know, and that's the thing is when you're, when your downside is bigger than your upside, don't do the deal. Right. So, you know, we looked at the deal and we said, we can go down to 30% occupancy. You mean you look at worst case scenario. What is worst, worst case, case scenario. scenario? Yep. That's the first thing you should be looking at. Everything, right. everybody in these, all these meetings, they all want to say, well, I can make 30 grand or 40 grand or 50 grand. But this applies grand. to all investing. Every, right? All investing, right? Right. So you've got to understand your risk and you got to understand like, okay, I can do this flip and make 10% return. Right. And you're like, okay, so I'll do the, I'll do the deal. Right. Well, no, what can you lose? And I think a lot of people are looking at the gain and not what they could lose. Exactly. And I think that's the first thing you should look at. And that's what we looked at with this, with this RV park and our whole team has this philosophy and this mentality. When you look at a deal, when a deal comes in, sure, you got to be creative on how you can make it work. Of course. But we look for reasons not to do the deal. As soon as it's coming in, we're looking at, oh my God, if it, you know, if this happened or that happened, it would, it would lose this much value. We would lose this much money. And what's our upside? Oh, our upside's that. Okay. Well, the up, the downside is way bigger than the upside. Why would you ever take on that much risk for that little of reward? And so with the RV park, we did that. We said, we can go down to 30% occupancy. It's currently a hundred percent occupied with a 60 person wait list. And you know, we can raise rents 150 bucks a month. We can increase NOI by $33,000 a month. We can add 16 spots. We can add $10,000 of revenue. We can increase the valuation by over $3 million. The upside is enormous. And, and the downside is, you know, the purchase price of 1.7 million. So we thought this is a no brainer. This, this meets all criteria and the market supports what we're setting out to do. And meaning that when we do a feasibility, our feasibility is amazingly um, detailed. So we'll, we'll go what in. Is, yeah, I was going to ask you, what does your yeah. feasibility team look like? Is that you guys, or do you hire, do you? Yeah. So we, you know? we, yeah, just quick around the room. We have an acquisitions and finance director who does all of our underwriting acquisitions and finance FPNA. Uh, he went to Rutgers has a finance degree, big background. He's owned dozens of houses. Um, that's Ben. We have Lindsay who does our feasibility. She used to work uh, for the intelligence community in Washington, D.C., hunting down terrorists, um, you know, working in the skiff and, 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 you know, aiming the, you know, the, the, the drone, so to speak, <laughs> to, yeah. to the high, to the yeah. high value targets. She knows a couple things about research and so she you're knows saying about she wears the pants in the <laughs> office. <Is that> what? <laughs> exactly. So she's way really to go good girl. At, That's all I got to say. Shout yeah. out. Right. Yep, exactly. So she knows she keeps us and keeps us, you know, in check on finding good deals and, knowing good markets and things like that. So she can, she can tell us exactly what the demand is going to be on any, in any given market. Um, then we have Scott who does strategy operations. He just knows a lot about development and um, he's the hammer, you know, I'm the grease probably. So he's, he's very like focused, get it done. Um, you know, and in uh, strategy and when in development, you know, it's kind of his wheelhouse. And then there's me, who's kind of the relationship guy. I like to get out. I like to meet people. I like to build our investor network. And then I, I spend a lot of time in permit offices. I travel a lot to different projects, uh, things like that. So what does our feasibility look like? So I'll give you a great example of our feasibility for our self-storage here in um, the Seattle area, south of Seattle, Maple Valley. So we look at the one, three, and five-mile ring around the drop pin of our location. And we look at how much population is in each one of those rings. And then we look at um, how many people um, live in those rings, and then we multiply it by a national statistic for utilization and consumption of self-storage. So, for example, if there's 10 people in a room and the national average is seven square feet per person, we know that there's 70 square feet of demand, right? Seven times 10. So if there's 
10,000 people within a mile of a facility and we use that heuristic. It's a very, there's, there's heuristic, there's, there is averages for every single MSA and we have data for that and Lindsay tracks that down. But we can determine how much unmet demand there is for storage. And then you go in and you can subtract out how much storage is there already. And then you can calculate how much square, foot, square feet of demand there is. And that's like, a, that's like a 30 second explanation. But there's so much more to it because just because there's demand, it doesn't mean that there's people willing to pay. So you have to go through that. Also, because I've been, I'm following you. I'm feeling butterflies from my own life. It, that also doesn't mean that there isn't two other groups building projects there. That's right. That you That's damn right. well better know about, right? Yep. So you got to do a. We have a. We use a, a couple of different programs. Uh, one is Reese for our data. We use um, uh, Radius uh, to pull permits that are coming up around our our site. And you got to know how much they're going to build and when they're going to come online and all these other things. And then you got to mystery shop all the facilities that are around there to kind of determine, okay, yeah, this is what the computer's telling me, but what's real, right? Right. Are these facilities full and what are they charging? So, and then you go age, demographic, population, household income, all this kind of gets put into a report and eventually you come up with your unit mix, which is you know, how much five by fives you need to build? How many five by tens, five by fifteens? And this is all ten. internally your team yes. ba- That's right. researching and doing all this. This isn't you hiring somebody to do a report for you on this. That's right. And we we do reports for other people. So people pay our company to do feasibility studies for them. Interesting. And then we do them our, ourselves internally. So, you know, what, what, time, look, what a lender require a, t- yes. a report as such prior yep. to, yeah, yeah. And even though, and see, and here's the other thing, right? So it's like, it's like you're doing your own books, right? The lender is kind of like, oh, you're doing your own books. Like, how do I know you're not right. putting something over here, right? So you got to hire that outside person. But for a feasibility study, when we did a feasibility study, we considered going a traditional route for financing and the bank required us to do a feasibility study from a third party provider, even though we already had the capability to do it, you know, by ourselves, they required us to go get another provider. So absolutely the bank is going to require, you know, uh, most likely depending on the bank and the lender and where it is and all that stuff is going to require a feasibility study. And as a, and as an operator and a builder or someone who's going to buy one of these places, you should get a study. (laughs) You should know what you're getting into. I mean, a lot of people, you know, I see a lot of deals that come in and we do, we do a little quick and do, we have a quick way of doing like a quick de- desktop study, right? You know, it How takes, much does a study like that cost if somebody were to hire you or some other third party feasibility group? Um, you know, I don't know the exact, but a quick, something quick and dirty, probably 500 bucks, you know, wow. something that, something that doesn't require going out to the site and studying all the other facilities and, and, and really writing a report for somebody else to glean information from. I mean, you can I mean, get I mean, the reason why I say that is because there are people listening today that are um, probably wholesalers or real estate agents and brokers. And obviously everyone is going to know at the end of this, that, that, Spartan Investment Group would be an awesome place to passively invest through, right? But there are people that might have the capability out here of providing leads, right? And so if they knew that they could spend X amount of money to provide a better quality lead that maybe they've, you know, taken a run at a feasibility on. um, That's right. Something to think about, right? Because the better information, all you agents and brokers and wholesalers and stuff that are listening, the better information you can provide, the more valuable your lead is, right? So that's right. And we actually do a lot more than just that. We'll do pro forma, we'll do development, assessment. You know, we do a lot of different, you know, it's not our, you know, we definitely offer consulting. It's It's not not your business model to do that, but yeah, it's not our bread and butter, but we get asked a lot. And so we're like, all right, we get asked so much for this stuff. We might as well put together a formal program. And if somebody asks us, you know, cause we, cause you know, we would do it for free if time was, was falling from the sky, but you know, I've well, got to pull. Well, also you get an opportunity to buy that deal then, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And we get a, we get a lot of that though. We're all, oh, Hey, you know, why don't you just do all the studies and tell me if this right. is a good deal or not. And then, and I'm like, well, you know, yeah. we got, trust me, we got a hundred deals on our desk. We're looking at like, you know, yeah. Yeah, how about how about you know you pay for the study and then we'll just do the study and then if it's a good deal like we'll 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 comp the stu- you know but we're not going to take the risk of time if you know we right. got 
we have a lot of different ways. And I'm not trying to be harsh, no. but, you know, when you, when it, when it's, you know, you only have so much time and you have to protect your time so you can stay focused on the mission that you're trying to carry out. Right. So we just, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times people come up to me and they say, Hey Ryan, there's this building and it's in this air market and it's priced this way. And da, da, da. you know, what do you think about the zoning and changing it? And what do you think? And what do you think? And I always just say, stop. The only thing that matters is the demand. If there's no demand, don't even bother the zoning, you know, whether it can be changed or not, or if it's zoned perfectly, or if it's a beautiful building, if the demand is not there, you cannot do what you want to do. And that's, you know, it's, we don't have this, oh, build it and, and they'll come attitude. Right. Um, you know, it's very risky. And, you know, you know, what do you want to write your vacancy at for stabilized self storage? Um, 20%. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of people out there, you know, listening to this might think, oh my God, I'm going to go get into storage. But let me tell you, there is, there is no such thing. I mean, it's very hard to find as a blue ocean market, meaning that this is still a super competitive asset class, not to deter right. anybody or discourage anybody, but this is not the low hanging fruit asset class that it was 10 years ago. This is a four and a half cap, sometimes sub four cap rate. Don't talk to me if you don't have the money ready to go and 30 days, <laughs> kind of a, like everything else. These like houses. everything else. It's not. So let's talk about that then, Ryan. What's your yep. MO for you guys? Are you guys, as far as your sure. acquisition, um, focus on your criteria? I, I feel like maybe I've been, you know, sure. loving to see what you guys are up to. And you guys do a lot of value add. You're looking for, first, you're looking for either existing stuff that has additional dirt or some other way you get additional units on there to make up for that four and a half cap crap that you have to deal with That's or right. you're looking for. So do you guys prefer to buy existing stuff where you can do value add on additional unit ads, you know, more space, more dirt, whatever. Um, That's right. Or yeah, so, do you prefer ground up? So, so either or is, is great, right? This depends on the numbers and the deal ground up or value add. You, you nailed it. That's exactly what we're looking for. So, um, is that, is that how, did you actually, did you actually get your RV park because you were looking for self-storage dirt yeah. and it came with it? <laughs> yeah. Or, well, yeah, or did so, you, yeah. Yeah. It was kind of funny. We, we made this thing in Podio just kind of quick. There's about 25 different places you can find storages on the internet. And we're like, oh my God, it's going to be impossible to keep up with all these different sites. It's not like there's a Redfin and a Zillow. It, it's like there's a Redfin, Zillow, da, 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 and you got to look everywhere and nothing talks to each other and it's not very sophisticated. So we created something in Podio that just scrubs all those things together. An API web scrubber, our intelligence person did that. So, and then it scrubs, it scrapes the information that we want. And then it funnels only the deals that we want to look at with right. the keywords in Podio. And then we have a, we had an intern for a while go through and, and kind of do some demand, a couple other procedures and processes that a human has to do. And then it lands on Ben's desk. And by the time it goes onto Ben's desk, it's pretty much, only stuff that he wants to look at all the, all the fluff is gone. All the, you know, the huge low cap stuff that we don't want right. to look at is gone. So we, that led us to Lubbock, Texas, right? Every, this, this business is a relationship business more than it is numbers or deals or anything. It's, it's a relationship business. And Julie, I know that you guys know that really well, Julie and Joe. So it's, it's all about making connections and it, that one, that connection leads to another thing. And our portfolio that we found in Lubbock off this optimizer, um, fell apart and the broker liked working with us and said, Hey, you guys do RV parks. And we're like, absolutely not. <laughs> and uh, he goes, well, he goes, how about a, how about a 17% cap rate off market deal that has a ton of upside? And we're like, yes, we do those things. Um, <laughs> so we, so we went out there and checked it out. And when we saw the land, it was the at first blush. It was, Hey, we want to, we want to buy this RV park, get it all cleaned up. And then there's this acreage in the back that we can put storage on. But we did our demand study and there wasn't a lot of demand for storage. So as we started took, taking over the park, kind of figuring out what we're going to do for extra revenue streams, we realized that there was so much demand for RVs and that we could put another 14 spots in the back of the park and that would fill up faster than anything. Sweet. Um, so, we, you know, that was kind of our, you know, kind of our pivot, you know, to the next thing. And, and I will say one really exciting thing that happened this week um, with our storage deal that we just bought. We talked about value add. I had 14,000 existing. And then we bought this place thinking that we bought it at about an eight and a half cap. 
thinking we could add somewhere between, you know, maybe eight to 10,000 square feet of storage on it. And so when you do the valuation, it's a dollar 35 a, uh, revenue per square foot. So when you think about 10,000 square feet, it's like 13, five a month, right? So every single, you know, square foot you can add is more revenue. And we did the demand study. Of course, there's a lot of unmet demand. We know we can fill it up. The facility is at 97%, blah, 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 raising rents. So we actually, the site is littered with buildings that are all detached around the property. So there's gaps in between each building. And we're trying to, we're working with a really good team of architects that are actually based in Seattle, helping us optimize our storage site so we can get as many units in there as possible. And one thing we did was we asked the utility company if they would abandon the easements in between each of those buildings. And um, they agreed to it, which <laughs> kind of surprised us. I mean, wow. it's been that way for 30 plus years. So now we can fill in the gaps in between each building and rent it out. So that added roughly 3,000 square feet of additional storage that nice. we can rent. I mean, that's a $700,000 valuation at this position. I mean, that is the kind of stuff you can do in value add deals, just little tweaks, right. little refining things, getting a good team together. And it's just really exciting to be able to and do that stuff. And having a vision, you know, we used to go into big apartment, like I used to do big apartment deals, 200 units, for example, we'll say that had laundry rooms and that we go put the, we put stacks in the washer dryer stacks in the units and then convert the laundry rooms to an extra bedroom, right? So you yep. pack it on and that's that value add, right? It's already existing there. I mean, it was a sweet, you know, that just adds, you add X amount of thousands of dollars per month times 12 to your NOI and cap that. That's a lot of money, right? I mean, it's exactly, yep. it's, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the fun part, right? Isn't that the fun part? It is the fun part. And, and what makes it so much more fun than say flipping a house or doing that is just that you get this asset, you get these, you know, you get hundreds of doors underneath one roof, right? And, P, and the day that you take it over, hopefully you're getting some cash flow. Like you're making money the day that you close. So it's not as stressful where you're carrying a huge hard money loan or you're trying to get this thing on the market as fast as possible. You know, you, you've got, you've got the revenue, which psychologically is just, and financially is great. And then you start saying, okay, now that I've had this asset for a little while, like what could, what else could we do to sort of optimize, you know, revenue? And, and, and then not only do you get the cash flow that month or that year, but then you get it in the valuation because your NOI is driving your, your um, termination, you know, your terminal value of the facility. So then it just gets, I mean, it gets even more exciting. It's like, yeah, you know, we just added, you know, roughly $4,000 a month of revenue, but really what it means is that the facility we'll have a term, a higher terminal valuation based on the cap rate. We, we, I think we put it at like a seven cap or an eight cap, which is, you know, another $700,000 to add to disposition. And then the investors are super excited because, you know, they probably own anywhere from two to 6%, you know, depending on how much they invested of that capital. So now all of a sudden they, they just earned another 14 to $20,000 on the deal that they never even knew they had. Exactly. And, um, so anyway, it's just a lot of what, fun. What, what, do, what do you guys find is the most challenging uh, part of self storage? You know, to get your building. You know, either <laughs> um, I guess I guess there's two different animals. There's yes. value add versus new developments. A whole another challenge. So I would, level. yeah, I'd probably say there's two the two the two challenge or two buckets of challenge are operations, which is running the facility. You have all kinds of you know those are that's kind of one bucket, and then you have development, and development is interesting. Um, you know, you have, you know, depending on the way the land is zoned, we've gone through rezones um, recently of a, of a residential lot to a commercial lot that conveyed with the sale so we could expand. So I had to go in front of the board of commissioners. We have to work with the civil. We have to work with the neighbors. We have to do public notices. We have to do all these things. And like, you're just, you're just kind of preparing for the worst all the time. You're preparing for that ugly neighbor to come out and just ruin your project, right? So you're spending, we call it a pre-mortem where we go through every single thing that could go wrong, right? And we say, okay, what are we going to say when this, when this gets said? What are we going to say when that gets said? What are we going to do when this comes out of the woodwork, right? right. Who's going to address this question? Are we talking question? about the design review process? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Design yeah. review or conditional use permitting or a rezone or a variance or expansion or anything that you have to go through. It could be very, very difficult. The other thing too is, you know, you go but into that, the But city. you don't necessarily have those challenges if you buy an existing mismanaged 
this is only if we're talking about expansion. Correct. That's right. right. So if you buy an existing facility, you're not going to have, and you're not adding any space or units or changing use, you're not going to have these challenges we're talking about when you're That's doing. Right. right. Okay. And, and people, you know, for, from the operation standpoint, when, you know, there's new ownership, people don't like change. Right. So, um, you know, collecting all the leases and the rents and, you know, we just always have those couple customers that just want to just wait to the last legal second to pay their bill. And we got to chase them around and, you know, we charge them a late fee, which is a, which is a revenue stream. Um, as someone put it once, it's beer money. Um, you know, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of annoying to, you know, you know, our, you know, Jackie, who does all of our asset management and property management, cause we actually directly operate all of these facilities ourselves. Um, you know, you know, if she doesn't have a frontline employee to kind of help her with those, those things, you know, she, and she's directly managing of say so an unmanned is what you're saying. Yeah, right. we self. Yeah, we we self manage all of our. Do you guys facilities. charge a asset management fee to your investors? We do. Okay, everybody does. Yeah, so I'm yeah not we don't. Yeah, we don't charge it to them directly. We charge. You know, obviously, it's you know it's above the line. Right. Um, charge to the facility, and you know it, it. It actually is is very representative to do that because, you know, if, if let's just say we decide, hey, we can't, we don't have the capacity to manage this anymore. We're going to have to have that line itemized. Right. budget. We have to let the line item in our budget to like hire a property management company. Um, we just, you know, we just think that, um, you know, we, we, there's definitely a lot of really good property management companies out there that, that do storage. Um, you know, but when you're having a facility that grosses, you know, $2.2 $2 million a year, it's really, really tough to stomach that 6% gross <laughs> uh, right. to a property management company. That's kind of the going rate in storage. So we just kind of, you know, making this more of a business, we decided, we made the decision that we're going to take that revenue and we're going to hire internal people, um, to be our property management and asset management people. We're going to grow our company, kind of vertically integrate our company to do that. And that kind of helps us add more people and you can get more synergies. When you go into a, a competitive market, you know, we have control of our costs to have that person there, um, you know, versus, you know, if, you know, there's, there's synergies, right? I mean, you can hire, you know, a hundred thousand dollar a year person to manage, you know, five facilities versus, you know, spending $160,000 right. a year on each one for outside right. property management. Now there's a lot of value that property managers also bring to the facilities such as experience. And they also have a big team and costs of, you know, even if you have a little facility, sometimes you can, you know, sneak in and be, a, be, be sort of their loss leader, you know, even though they're, you know, you're kind of a small fry, you know, they'll, they'll pick you up right. just because they want to, you know, they, they, they want the revenue. So, so aside um, from self storage facilities, you guys come across deals that are like I, I see some you know um, entitlement type projects for infill yeah. uh, deals and stuff like that. Are you actively pursuing those as well, or they just happen to come across your desk as your? Um, yeah, we've done. Yeah, we we have deals. strategic partnerships with some other operators. We have a guy in Michigan that we're doing. A, we have a twenty acre parcel that we purchased and we we subdivided into seventeen lots. Um, and then we're putting in all the utilities, got all the entitlements and, um, we're going to sell the lots off to a home builder. Right. Um, we so do, you we guys, do. Are you guys not interested in building those out? You're interested in, you know, putting in the infrastructure and, and entitling the, the stuff. Is that your MO more? Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would, I would say so. And, yeah. and even, you know, from storage perspective, I mean, um, you know, you can get a lot of value out of building the facility, but, um, you know, we're, we're just, you know, we know that there's a home builder that's way more economical than we are. And, you know, they're, they're willing to pay a higher price for the lots, you know, versus, you know, what we could right. squeeze out of trying to build them, you know, inefficiently. Well, yeah. As a lover of self-storage though, if you guys came across, I mean, you do have, and you do have new build and dirt for, I think your, what, your Maple Valley facility, right? Yep. That's right. Do you think that you'll build that out and keep it or? Oh, we're definitely building that out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, exactly. Yep. No. Right yeah. On. We, um, you know, kind of our strategy there, I mean, it was to build it out, lease it up, refi out everybody's money, and then, um, you know, then operate and then eventually just sell, to sell. And then, they, you know, people get kind of two big tranches of capital. They get all their capital plus a return on the refi, kind of like a big burr right. after it's leased up and stabilized. And then, and then when the property sells, they would get um, fees from disposition, you know, get a payout from disposition. Yep. But the... Um, but the big thing that's kind of trending right now is what's called C of O deals, certificate of occupancy. So we're actually um, considering building the facility and then selling it off to a REIT or an institutional buyer at, uh -huh. at 
closing. And they usually are willing to pay 80% of the stabilized value. Wow. So essentially they're saying, Hey, we'll, we'll take, we'll take it from here. We'll run it. You know, we can probably run it better than you can anyway. Right. Um, Cause we've got call centers and SEO and Google AdWords and all that other stuff. And, and, you know, in-house management training program that's way more sophisticated than anything that you can find. And we have, oh, by the way, we have managers in the area that run our other facilities that we can kind of use to train new set employees. And they'll buy the facility when you get the keys to it. So that's a huge deal because, you know, you know, your risk, there's a lot of risk in buying land, but not really. I mean, you know, half a million bucks for some land, you know, then, then you spend, you know, seven or we're spending about 8 million, about eight and a half million on building this facility. So, you know, your risk is, your risk is not really during construction or when you and buy when the you're, land. And when you're doing that, are you doing that all through cash, through a capital raise? Yes. Excellent. Yep. Yeah, awesome. we do a deed of trust or, or you know, there's equity uh, through capital raises from investors. And then, you know, but when we, when we finish, your biggest risk is really your lease up risk, right? Because you're standing on this pile right. of, you know, this huge loan and there's no right. customers in your building. So you got to factor in that time it takes to lease up the building. And then that's really where it's risky. So if a, if a REIT comes in and says, hey, we'll take this off your hands for a little discount, you know, it's like, you got to yeah. be smart enough to know yeah. when to cash in rather than feel like you need to stick in to get every ounce of juice, right? That's I mean, right. That's exactly. Right. Are you guys focused on certain markets or are you just focused on whatever you're, are you opportunistic on whatever comes across your desk that hits your Yeah, area? so we, we look in gross growth markets. So we're, we're not interested in, in where, where population is declining, like the Midwest or... Um, some parts of the Northeast. And what are the top um, growth markets projecting forward, like Atlanta? So, oh yeah, I mean Atlanta is a big growth market. Um, Florida is on fire. I mean, yep. baby boomers are moving down here like every day in droves. Um, it's 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 an income right. There's no taxable income down here. So Tampa and Orlando and even West Palm, Boca. I mean, all this whole area is just booming. And, um, that's, that's, that's a big area, you know, the sun, the, you know, the what sunshine about this, state. Uh, Amazon HQ2 stuff. Are you thinking about that at all? Or, well, we have property in Washington, DC. So crystal city is just a stone throw across the sit across the river. I mean, crystal city essentially is DC. It's crystal city, Virginia is right next to the national airport there. That's actually where my first crash pad was. <laughs> ah, um, there you go. yeah, kind of, kind of funny. It was right in crystal city. Full circle. Yeah. So that is where Amazon plans to add jobs. And of course, it's going to just add to the already booming area that is Washington, D.C. and then New York. Um, I think it's Long Island City. Um, you know, I'm not that familiar with the New York market, um, but uh, we, we did look at a deal up in Yonkers um, for a little while. But I mean, if you look around the Pacific Northwest, we are in one of the best markets. I mean, Snohomish County is booming and, and uh, you know, uh, King County is booming and Maple Valley is booming. and um, you know, even, you know, getting, you know, just across the mountains, Spokane is a great market and yeah. Bend, Oregon is exploding and Boise and all these places around the, the Northwest are, are just really good places. People are moving to these places. And are um, the, be- are the people that rent self storage, like your demographic mm-hmm. stats on that? Who, are, who, who rents self storage? So I would say that the demographic is, you know, you, you, you want to have enough income, but not too much. So, you know, usually that $55,000 a year, um, household income is, is kind of the sweet spot for a minimum starting point. Um, but you're really looking for areas. Um, you know, I really like areas where there's kind of an older demographic because there's a lot of boomers and you probably have this experience and you see, you know, baby boomers that have a lot of stuff and then they downsize. So then they have all this stuff and it's like, and it's a valuable stuff because it's, you know, it's keepsakes and memories and things like that. Um, you know, that, that, um, they need to put somewhere. So they store it or a millennial that moves their job, you know, every year or every couple of years and they have stuff that they have to hold on to, or they're going to move back or whatever. Right. So you're so, layering your, are you layering your demographic on top of your demand? I mean, I guess they're one and the same, right? So you can, is that like a zero in on demand? So demand is whatever you were talking about, some numbers and calculations there. And then on top of that is income level in the area. Yeah. Income level, you know, ability to pay. I mean the, you know, the, you know, you could be offering a great, you know, something to eat and you're starving. And if you don't have the money to pay for it, it doesn't matter how much demand there is for that food. You can't pay for it. Right. So, 
you know, it's, it's, it's income levels, it's job growth. And, you know, we really look population drives self storage. It's a mathematical certainty when people move or migrate to an area, there's, you know, there's a, there's a metric you can pull from that MSA from that, you know, surrounding area city demographics that tells you what the population growth is projected to be or is. And then you can zoom in on, okay, where, where can you find the, de- the unmet demand within that market? And it's, it's literally a sniper approach. So storage five years ago, you could just throw a dart at a wall and just go anywhere in that MSA and you'd be fine. Now you've got to be perched up on top of the building and you've got to snipe that intersection where to put that stealth storage. Because if you don't, you could be building in an area that's already saturated. And, and 50% of your storage comes from drive-by traffic. People within three miles of the facility are your renters. So if you, you, that's another thing you look at. You look at drive-by traffic counts. How many cars a day are going to go by your facility and see it? That's huge because it well, used to be... let me ask be, you, what a, big, what a good leading indicator for our other investors listening of wherever you see self-storage being built, is that a potential indicator of some other types of assets that might be fitting well in that market or other, uh, you get what I'm saying? Absolutely. Reverse engineering off of, you know, I always think about that kind of stuff. Well, what's going in where, um, and you know, some of these higher, more expensive projects like these, you know, like, you know, Spartan investment group talking about where they're investing in their storage facilities might be a good indication of, where other investors for other asset classes might also consider because they need the same demographics. Exactly. And you know, the the other thing too is, and I know really in the weeds, but we look at what the average rent rate is for that area to determine if we can even build there and have it be worth it. Right. Because if you can only get so much rent and it costs so much to build, you can't even build there. Well, that's the same for multifamily construction. Exactly. That's a That's right. major issue right now is it's not right. even, you can't even cover the cost to build. The co- construction costs are outweighing the benefit to build new apartment buildings in you know, certain areas. Certain That's right. Areas, like, like our area, you know, right here, I think is one of those areas. Well, we could go on and on and on and on. <laughs> let, me look down my, let me look down my list here. Um, are you guys ra- raising money for any projects right now? We are. Um, we have a couple raises in the works. Um, they are offered under 506B, so I can't talk about the deal and advertise it. Yep. Otherwise, I will violate um, SEC agreements. But Julie and I, you know, Julie, Joe, myself, we all know each other. Um, so, you know, you guys could, could hear those details, but then your listeners would have to, right. would be disqualified and then I would be um, violating the exemption by advertising it because I'm not okay. doing a so C have- offering. We won't talk about that anymore, all, you know, necessarily. But do, can you say something like, can you, are you allowed to say like what minimum investment levels? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Usually our returns are 15 to 20%, usually, depending on the deal um, for equity. And uh, our minimums are usually 50,000. Um, and, you know, the way that people can sort of get on our, get in our program for 506B offerings is we have a process that we follow where, Somebody can send me an email or we have it on our website. We have an intake form where they can fill out. And then I get, and I, meet, I reach out to them, email them, and then I do an um, a, a introductory call and kind of learn more about what their preferences are and their investment style and things like that. We keep a relationship going. And then that kind of enables them to be um, assess sophistication. And then also it establishes that pre-existing relationship that, that we can then um, have them uh, you know, we can advertise a deal to them through our email distribution. So that's how we kind of our process that we follow to bring investors in. So you guys heard it here. These guys know what they're doing. I know I'll <laughs> be having that special relationship meeting at Bongo's one of these, <laughs> right? Um, so hey, what about, let me ask perfect. you, has your, has your, um, what are your goals for 2019 for SIG? Yep. So, so for SIG for 2019, our goals is to put another hundred million of uh, assets under management. Um, it's a very steep goal. It's very challenging. There's a lot of frustration right now because it's very hard to buy the right project. Um, but uh, that is our goal for that. 
Um, we do have a few capital raises, um, probably north of 10 million that we have to do in 2019 to achieve those goals. Um, and we also, you know, have a grow. We, we're actually hiring right now. We're hiring a director of acquisitions um, to help out Ben because Ben is doing finance and acquisitions. So we're trying to get him more into the finance role. So we're hiring. Um, we'll probably bring on two two members, two team members in 2019. Are those salaried also, people that you're bringing on? Yes, yeah, salaried, but they're on a draw. Okay. So uh, acquisitions will be on a draw, be commission. Um, you know, they'll get a, a nice chunk of commissions based on. Uh, you know, we have a philosophy. Whoops. Uh oh. Uh oh. We just lost him. Hey guys, Ryan, we just lost Ryan. So this might be the end of our awesome podcast today. He's still there. He just, we can't hear him. Zapped off. Well, how about if I tell you a funny joke in the meantime? So two guys walked into a bar. No, I don't know. I don't know any funny jokes here. Well, we have been, regardless if we can get Ryan to jump on, he'll jump back on. But needless to say, uh, Ryan Gibson and his partners at Spartan Investment Group um, are very, very smart, um, conservative, which I like. I know personally for myself, I'm super interested in investing with them because I do believe the asset classes that they're pursuing are, um, are great uh, investment opportunities that you guys might all want to consider um, as you get going and you're more experienced. Or if, like I said, if you like doing what you do, if you love flipping houses, then continue to flip your houses. We're not talking about, you know, that you shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff and that you need to get into self-storage. But what I, what you will find as you flip houses and you, you do your other investments, um, you know, single family burr investing and all that stuff is great. Small multifamily investing is great. Um, but you'll find that being involved as a passive investor, um, maybe through syndication, such as what you can get through Spartan Investment Group, might be something that um, you should consider sooner rather than later in order to offset, have an opportunity to offset some of the other income that you're earning through um, pursuing what it is that your your passion is uh, to spend your time on. Um, just because you're spending, like I, that, that's what I'm saying, spending time um, doing what you love might be ordinary income. And there's an entire tax discussion um, that uh, you guys need to consider as you grow through your investing career where you're going to want to invest in different asset classes and things like that that might have the opportunity to create passive losses and other types of passive income for you. So check out the Spartan Investment Group website um, at spartan-investors.com. Uh, follow them on Facebook. Uh, look them up on Facebook where they announce they have some cool webinars and trainings and blogs and speaking engagements at events that they do um, and just engage with those guys and continue to learn um, beyond this podcast today. So I'm going to assume that Ryan can't jump back on um, or that some giant big tractor, you know, pile of money just got dumped on him and buried him <laughs> <laughs> and he got buried and he can't talk to us right now <laughs> under all his, all his uh, awesome investment money there. But um, Ryan, if you're listening, um, uh, oops, I think he's probably calling me. This is probably him right here. Hold on. This is Julie. Hey, no worries. I'm, I'm wrapping it up. Hey guys, I got Ryan on my cell phone here right now as I'm talking to you. Oh, I'm just bragging on you. I'm just bragging on you. I'm talking to, Hey guys, I'm talking to Ryan on the phone. So, um, I'm going to hang up with you, Ryan, and we're just wrapping up and we're, we're telling everybody how they can reach you. Um, through social media and your website. And we're just doing some, some general bragging on your behalf about you and Spartan Investment Group. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, I'm going to hang up with Ryan, guys, and wrap it up with you. So, Ryan, let's catch up and we'll have lunch, okay? And I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Okay, guys, I just wrapped up with Ryan. And uh, as you know, this is, this is uh, what happens when you're using technology. Um, but uh, thank you for listening today. Check out uh, uh, 
Spartan Ingress Investment Group more online. Um, and if you're interested in investing with them, I'm sure, as Ryan stated, there's a way to get in touch and go through that 506B process with them to start developing a relationship. Because not only are they smart investors, but they're just generally awesome, super good guys. So you're going to want to hang out with them anyway. Um, but over, other than that, Joe, um, where can everybody find the details about today's podcast? Yeah, if you guys are driving your car or whatever right now, we have all the show notes, including the links that Julie mentioned at seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 56. That's seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 56. And if you're enjoying this podcast at all, please, 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 please give us a review on iTunes at seattleinvestorsclub.com slash iTunes. We would love you for that. Love you for that. Awesome sauce. Well, Joe, you have fun off on your adventures this week. I actually am going on an adventure pretty soon. You'll be proud of me. I'm hitting the ladies, moms, girls weekend. We're going to Whistler. So I have that to look forward to. But I also have to look forward to seeing you this weekend at our next Seattle Investors Club meetup, right? And we have Mark Canton uh, coming this weekend. You guys are listening to this. It's already happened. Um, but um, if you want to get on the Seattle Investors Club RSVP list for our future meetings and future information, we got all kinds of great stuff going to happen in 2019. Um, just go to our website, seattleinvestorsclub.com and engage with us. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And we hope to see you all soon. Definitely. Right on. Other than that, I'm going to go eat the biggest sandwich I can find. <laughs> Good. <laughs> While Joe goes and finds that awesome pizza. Yep, that's so, the plan. That's what happens to me here. By the time we get done with these things, I'm always starving. So <laughs> see you later. Time for lunch. <laughs> All right, guys, over and out. Catch see you, you later. Time. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Seattle Investors Club podcast. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered on the show, shoot us an email at info at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Now go out, take that action, and build that real estate business. Thanks for listening.